good to be uh, back with all of you in this Zoom space here. Uh, excited to be able to um, share a little bit from God's Word as we continue on in this anchored uh, series throughout our summer. Um, been having a good last three weeks. So three weeks ago to the day, to the morning, uh, our daughter was born, uh, Madison Riley Prickett. And um, my wife, Jessie, was a champ. I mean, just so strong and uh, amazing. It was a long, long labor. Um, and so, but she just did an incredible job. And um, it was, yeah, three, three, three weeks ago this morning, Sunday morning, um, when Madison, you can kind of see her swaddled up over there. And, um, and uh, I see Gabe doing something on my screen. You've been a great big brother, Gabe. You've just been awesome and you're doing a great job. So anyway, we're having, we're having a good time figuring out how to uh, become a family of four and, um, and get sleep in the midst of that. So as we go into it this morning, I'm grateful for coffee and a little bit of adrenaline that comes in uh, uh, teaching God's word as well. So I see some, I think some amens happening there. But um, so, hey, I just, I wanna do a quick prayer here, a, a couple of phrases from Psalm 25 that I wanted to pray over us this morning, and then we're gonna dive in. So pray with me. In you, Lord our God, we put our trust. We trust in you this morning. Do not let us be put to shame, nor let our enemies triumph over us. Guard our lives and rescue us. Do not let us be put to shame, for we take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect us, because you, because our hope, Lord, is in you. Deliver, deliver us as your people, O oh God, from all of our troubles. And so we look to you, Jesus, uh, the ever-present one who is with us uh, this morning. And we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So when I was 21, uh, it was my senior year of college, and uh, I had more hair than I have now. And I didn't have glasses yet. And it's actually kind of funny. We show Gabe pictures of me with more hair and uh, without glasses. And I'm not sure he always recognizes me. And uh, I didn't have a beard either. So actually, I guess I should qualify that hair statement. I, I might have the same amount of hair. It just changed places. But uh, anyway, I, I was sitting in my intermediate microeconomics class. And I was very distracted. And uh, I was distracted because it, it was September and, and I'm thinking about life after college. Uh, since my early teenage years, I had sensed this call, you could call it a calling, but just a sense from God to pursue something pastoral um, as I went to college and kind of those years beyond college, some sort of a pastoral calling. And I was distracted in my thoughts because I'm trying to figure out what's after college, and and uh, I, I had I was having these thoughts as I'm sitting there, and and I remember this moment in this class, this intermediate microeconomics class, because I was sitting there and I just went, I think I'll pursue something in business instead, uh, and 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 it was like this intense moment. Uh, it, it doesn't. This story doesn't have anything to do with like pastoral calling, business, things like that is one better than the other. But in my life, the Lord had been speaking this thing and I'm sitting there going, I have too much sin in my life. Uh, I, 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 was, I felt like a failure as I was thinking about this next season of my life. I, I've shared in other contexts about um, this place of sexual addiction that I was, I was fighting and struggling and hadn't had the victory and the breakthrough yet that I was hoping for. And so there was this place of failure that I felt. Could I really take these next steps into pursuing this on the other side of college? I was trying to spend time with God every day. 
um, at this point in my life and I wasn't. <laughs> and so I, I felt this place of shame and uh, discouragement associated with that. Uh, I remember feeling really inadequate by a lack of experience in things related to uh, public speaking, preaching, teaching, different things that you might, uh, and other aspects associated with maybe this pastoral um, vocation. And uh, so here I am, and I'm just going, I don't, I don't know if I can pursue this stuff, even though I have felt the Lord leading me that direction. Um, if I could boil this down over years of reflecting upon this, and, and, and I'm not going to finish the story until the end of the end of the sermon, but I, I was really wrestling with shame. Uh, at the root, at the core of all of these pieces was a deep place of shame uh, that that had me not sure about if I had a place of belonging with God. And, and even with, with people, as I moved forward into some of these places, would there be a place for me in these ways where I was feeling shame and, and a failure? And uh, honestly, I was wondering, had God somehow uh, abandoned me in these places? Uh, I, I knew in my head, he hadn't abandoned me, he was with me, but there was this place of like, as I was moving forward, uh, could I really move forward into this? Uh, again, this, this story is not really about one approach to life or a career path, but it's about how do we stay anchored in what God has called us to as people, as a community, but as individuals, the things he's spoken to us when we experience places of shame in our lives. How do we stay anchored in uh, our identity, in who we are, in the purposes that God has for our lives, how do we stay anchored? Uh, not sure if you're like me in any of this, but uh, some of those messages that, uh, that happen when we're experiencing shame, I am a failure. I'm not sure if you've ever thought that before. I'm a failure, so I can't do X, or God couldn't use me in this way. Or, or I am unlovable. I'm not. I'm unworthy of truly being loved. Or, or, or I'm. I just feel bad. I feel defective about who I am. These are some of the messages that come out of uh, an experience that we have uh, with this, this, this thing, shame. Um, you know, if someone only knew such and such about my life, I'd feel so exposed and so ashamed. I don't know if any of you have ever thought these things or felt these things. Um, if I could define shame for us, uh, it's the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that you're flawed in some way, but not just that you're flawed, and therefore you're unworthy of love and belonging in relationship with God and in relationship with other people. And, and uh, it's, it's not, shame is not primarily about what we do. It doesn't have a lot to do with, with our actions and behaviors. It's connected to our core. Shame is about who we are. Uh, so it's not, I did something and I failed at it, but it's, I am a failure. And this is, this is intense. It leaves us feeling unlovable, alone, deeply flawed. Um, in this, the, just this sense of, anyway, we're, we're, I'm, I'm damaged goods fundamentally, and, and I'm not sure I could be used by God. I'm not sure I have a place. We're going to talk a little bit more about some of what shame is a little later, but I would propose that to experience shame is to be human in many ways. Uh, there's not a person on earth, I don't think, who experiences at some point in their life uh, this experience of shame. So then the question becomes, if we brought our shame before God, how would God respond to our shame? How does he respond to our shame? So we've got these places in our lives that, that maybe we've experienced shame, and what if our shame had an encounter with Jesus, what would happen? 
What would he say? What would he do? Uh, how would he respond? So that's what we're going to look at this morning. Uh, we're going to see what happens when uh, Jesus has an encounter with a person who had a, a pretty significant amount of shame in their life. Now, as we look at this, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll dive into this passage uh, in just a moment, but that what we're going to be looking at in this story uh, is how does Jesus interact with this person? Okay, there's a lot of content in what Jesus says in this exchange, and I haven't shared with you what it is yet, uh, but I'm not going to unpack all of that. Go for it this week, dive into it, um, and, but don't be distracted if you don't understand all the specific content, uh, because what we're going to look at today is how does Jesus interact with the person? Uh, even as I read through some of the portions of this passage, feel free to close your eyes. Uh, feel free to put yourself into this experience um, as you're thinking through. Use your imagination to think, what, what may it have been like? Um, and the other thing I want to mention just before we dive in is it's an interesting thing when we're looking at how Jesus interacts with people because he's representing for us how God interacts with humanity and people but he's also representing for us how uh, like the relational experience that people need as humans and how we can respond as humans because he's fully God and fully human. And so as we look at this, I'm, I'm largely looking at how does God respond to our shame? But there's a big place of that that also is Jesus is an example for us as to how uh, we need human interaction that also needs to happen in the same way as Jesus represents it um, in our experience as humans. And anyway, I'll, I'll unpack that more near the end if that didn't make sense. But uh, okay, so John 4, we're going to dive in to some about John 4. Uh, as you're maybe making your way there, uh, I'm going to be reading from NIV. And um, I want to give a plug for the um, the video series, The Chosen. Uh, episode eight, the last episode of the first season, uh, has an incredible, what I think it was an incredible depiction of John four, what is typically known as, you know, uh, kind of referred to as Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well, or Jesus talking with the Samaritan woman. And uh, so we're gonna look, look through this, but I, I commend that to you to, uh, pay with a little fee or whatever to, to purchase that episode or to find a way to watch that. It's really powerful. All right, I'm going to start. We're going to read, start here by reading verses four through nine. So Jesus, um, he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Uh, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus Tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Okay, so... It's about noon, and this woman comes out to the well by herself. So typically, in, in that time, uh, the women of the village would have gone out together in the morning before the, the somewhat oppressive heat of the day, um, before it got too intense. And so we're getting an initial glimpse here of some of what's going on in this story as, 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 the, as John is capturing this in the Gospel of John. Um, that uh, there's something about this woman that's abnormal in how she's acting. And we're getting this glimpse that shame is a part of this woman's story as she's kind of hiding and isolating herself, as she's, she's uh, separating herself from community and going out to this well at a very abnormal time. And so as, as we, some other things unfold, as you continue to look at this passage, in the context of public relationships, um, interactions between Samaritans and Jews, uh, as well as interactions between 
public interactions between a man and a woman, especially kind of in isolation like that, would be typically kind of off limits in terms of kind of the social interactions of how uh, clean and unclean worked in terms of the, the worship dynamics of Jews and Samaritans that had shame attached to it, and as well as the kind of male and female interaction in public in this honor and shame culture, um, there's a lot of, uh, more than even undertones, but of shame dynamics in relationships happening in this passage. And then we'll find out even more as we go that there's this added layer of uh, shame related to ha her having had, we haven't gotten there in the story yet, but five husbands in the past and living with a, a man who wasn't currently her husband. And we don't, it's, it's a little hard to fully know um, is that, you know, is, is the shame associated with sin or things that were done to her that was her doing? There, there's some things we have to conjecture a little bit about what all's going on in her uh, situation there, but it is pretty safe to say that uh, shame is a part of her story and that as this story is unfolding, the gospel author is, is drawing this dynamic out. Um, of how significant it was that Jesus is interacting with her and that there's some things that we're supposed to be learning about how, how, Jesus, how Jesus interacts with her and how God wants to interact with humans in their places of, of shame. Um, I, I was actually, I, I had kind of studied some of these things and, and was kind of going this direction, but I was still thinking to myself, okay, am I reading too much into this passage? Is, is is this really a, a significant, is shame really front and center? And it was interesting, I, I just, I, I was, I, I was reading through, this was a few, a few months ago, as I was doing some initial prep on this, but I was reading through uh, Sheila Wise Rose book, Healing Racial Trauma, and I was just a few chapters in, and I, I felt, I sensed the Holy Spirit say, um, read her chapter on shame because one of the chapters in there is on shame. And uh, I thought, oh, okay. So I skipped ahead. I wasn't that far along in the book. And, and as I'm reading through the chapter, she frames the whole chapter in the context of John 4 and Jesus's interaction with this woman. And uh, so anyway, even as I've been living in this passage and processing it in my own life, that was kind of a final little um, just wink, if you will, of the Holy Spirit going, you're on the right track. Keep, keep going with this. Um, because it, it was neat. I was like, wow, I didn't know she was framing this whole thing on John 4. And uh, so I, I want to just share a, a few more thoughts before we really unpack how does Jesus respond to her in her place of shame. Uh, just a few, few thoughts related to shame in general. Um, cause this is something that I've been, I've been learning, trying to learn about for a while, but especially the past, uh, year and a half since even on the sabbatical, as we, as we did this program that, that Sean and Laura Richmond did recently. And, um, that alongside Jesse and I were learning some really neat things and significant things about the, the topic of shame. And so I just want to repeat this, that from before, it's this painful feeling or experience that we have of being deeply unworthy of love or belonging. And it, it, it actually can undergird a lot of other emotions and feelings and, that we have in life, um, from fear to, uh, you know, a desire to hide, contempt towards others, even anger at times. Under those, not always, but sometimes there can be this under place of shame. Now, Shame is different than guilt. So guilt has to do, and this is even goes all the way down to our neurochemistry, that guilt has to do with things that we do and behaviors. Uh, but shame has to do with a, a sense of identity of who we are as a person. Um, so guilt says, I did a bad thing. I did something wrong. Whereas shame says, I am bad. Uh, to use an example, kind of from what I shared in my own story, you know, shame would say, I didn't spend time with God this morning, therefore I am a failure 
as a follower of Jesus. Uh, whereas, and, and so anyway, that's, that's kind of what we're, we're talking about here. And um, it's, 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 it's a significant part of all of our lives. And so we're going to talk about when we get in those places, when we experience those uh, experiences of, when we experience the experience of shame, uh, how does God respond to us? And what hope does he have for us to anchor us in a way that transforms, heals, and removes those places of shame in our lives? Because that is what his purpose is um, for our lives and for these places of shame. And so my, my, my contention is that there's no shame in heaven, and God's desire is to be removing our places of shame here on earth. But in many ways, some of these, this journey happens over the course of our lives. When we come to Jesus initially, his purpose is that shame would be eradicated and that we wouldn't have these experiences and that we'd be able to walk into the full calling of who we are as sons and daughters of God. And yet, uh, it, to, it rears its ugly head. And uh, rather than try to ignore it, we want to take it and use that as a meeting place to meet with God. Uh, and so two resources, Brene Brown has written a lot about this. Uh, so you might be familiar with some of her stuff. I'd recommend that. And then a, a really significant um, guy who's a Christian, uh, who's kind of like a, a neuro I'm not exactly sure his title, but neuropsychologist or something. Uh, his name's Kurt Thompson, and he wrote a book called The Soul of Shame that is, is really powerful. Okay, how does Jesus respond to her? So let's read 7, verses 7 to 10. Uh, so we're going to repeat a little bit. So when a Samaritan woman uh, came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Uh, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. But Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So I want to I wanna say that at the outset, how Jesus responds is with an embrace. So Jesus's response to shame is embrace. Now, this doesn't necessarily always have to be physical. Now, this is good news for us in this COVID life that we're living here. Uh, but it's a relational embrace. That the heart of God to meet us is an embrace relationally. Um, and, you know, there is a place of, of the power of physical embrace as well, that is significant. Um, but he says, you know, it's significant in verse seven, he says, uh, will you give me a drink to this woman? Uh, this is not an act of disrespect uh, of like, hey, serve me or something like that. This is actually Jesus bestowing on her respect and honor. See, Jesus allows her to meet a need that he had. And even as fully God, he, he's, he has a need and a place of vulnerability that he, he brings before her. And we're going to learn that this place of vulnerability is really important in, in how we experience transformation in our places of shame. Um, he would have actually needed to drink out of her jar. Uh, in this context, you know, the, the actually literal phrasing for um, this thing about Jews do not associate with Samaritan is for Jews do not use the dishes that Samaritans had used. And so the concept, the concept of the day would have been in sharing a drink with a Samaritan would have made Jesus unclean. Um, and this sense of, of in, with an outsider, um, uh, just belonging. Whoa. So I just hit my keyboard here. And uh, hold on, getting back. Put my Bible on my keyboard. Totally messed up my notes. Okay, so talking with her, he asked her a question. 
So again, these, these could be, we could either easily just read, blow through these things, but this is really significant that Jesus engages in relationship with her. He talks to her. He asks her a question. Now, I don't know if, if this is uh, intended as this is recorded um, in the gospel, but as I read this, it reminds me of Adam and Eve in the garden. And this place of Adam and Eve uh, rejecting God, this rupture has taken place in their relationship with God. And the first thing that God does is he comes walking in the garden and he seeks out to re-engage in relationship with them. And how does he do it? He asks a question. Jesus loves to ask questions to us. It's a way that he comes to us in relationship and uh, he in engages us. He embraces us in relationship. So no matter what places of shame we have in our lives, he, he engages with us. And I would propose that his desire is to embrace us relationally as uh, when he comes to us. So I'm going to keep reading. So we see this again. We're, we're not going to unpack the content of all this, uh, though there's rich and really good things in here. But we just want to see that... Um, Typically, this, there's a lot that Jesus is doing here that he's breaking the, the cultural norms to say, I want to affirm who you are and come against any of the shame that you would experience. So let's see. We're going to keep reading. Uh, verse 11, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where, where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, Give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. She said, I have no husband. Uh, Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. All right. So I want to add to Jesus coming with an embrace. And I, I would propose that as I read this, what we see is that Jesus comes with an embrace, and it is an embrace of grace. Verse 10, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. I, it seems as though Jesus is, is trying to say, uh, none of your places of shame will hinder me from freely and fully giving you what I have to offer if you will just ask. You just have to ask. It's relational. It's free. It's, it's whoever, and, and then it's whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. It's not the people who have their act together. It's not the people who work really hard at it. It's not just these few select people over here. It's not just the men. It's not just the ones who worship over in this temple or on this mountain. It's whoever drinks this water that I will give. And he's saying, if you would have just asked for it, I would have given you this living water. So that's grace. There's grace that he has uh, all he has things available for us that we ask for it. We come in relationship, uh, and it's it's favor, it's grace, it's not earned. So when our place of great shame and disgrace is out in the open, in verses seventeen and eighteen, this piece about her, you know, having had five husbands and even living with a man who was not currently her husband. Um, he continues to engage in relationship with her. And this is remarkable. He actually, Jesus continues to expound upon possibly 
one of the most powerful teachings on worship in the whole Bible. And it is the first time we have recorded that Jesus reveals to someone outside of his own personal circle who he truly is as the Messiah and as, as God, as he says, I am uh, the one. And so there's something about him finding her, uh, uh, communicating a sense of worthiness and belonging that came even before major life transformation or uh, all of the, you know, even acceptance of who he was. That's an amazing thing about Jesus that he often allowed people, and this is grace, right? to belong and to, to have a place in his presence before they believed all the right things or before they had all their act together or their whole life together. And so his, he comes with an embrace to want to embrace this woman and that embrace is filled with grace. Uh, let's, let's keep reading. I want to finish this, this section here down to 26 to add one more important piece to this. So she says, sir, I can see that you're a prophet. You know, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, uh, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, well, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. So I want to add that when we see Jesus interacting with this woman, that it's an embrace of grace and truth. That Jesus comes to us in our places of shame and he If our shame was to encounter Jesus, it would encounter him giving us an embrace, a relational embrace, uh, 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 an embrace of grace and of truth. That this is what's needed uh, to transform our places of shame. Now, I can be tempted to think, oh, yeah, the truth is coming. You know, here we go. Let's bring the hammer now. Like, no, enough of the fluffy grace stuff. Um, But I would propose to you that's not at all the type of truth that we see Jesus bringing here. And yet he's bringing truth uh, nonetheless. But nowhere is there judgment, nowhere is there condemnation found towards her in her place of shame. Um, And yet there was a truth. And I would propose to you that this is an example of the type of truth that later in John, Jesus will say that if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Uh, And that the truth, if we think that we're kind of hearing a truth from God or from other people, and yet it's not coming with it, uh, grace or help to set us free, it's probably not God's truth. Uh, And so in this case, what, what does this truth look like? It's truth about what God is offering. He says that those who drink from this, another you could translate it as gushing up to eternal life in verse 14. This living water, that it would gush up in people to eternal life. Um, this concept of eternal life in the Gospel of John, uh, it, it, it has connotations for sure, kind of what would be obvious in our English language here of eternity, um, you know, life after this earth. But when John is using the phrase eternal life, it's, it's not only referring to that. It's referring to the age to come breaking into 
already breaking into this world. And so when, when, when John, the gospel of John is referring to eternal life, it's referring to the experience of the age to come being, breaking into this world, this reality. It starts the moment that someone meets Jesus or that we have this encounter with Jesus or that people in the gospel of John have an encounter with Jesus. Um, that, that's it. Eternal life is beginning. It, it is starting. And uh, so this is what God's wanting to do. He's wanting to bring the, the way that heaven sees us, the way that God sees us, the way that we will be as we're with Jesus for all of eternity. He's wanting us to live into that here on this earth. And he's, he's starting to communicate those things to this woman. There's also truth about how God relates or how we relate to God. I kind of mentioned that already, that there's an availability and access to relating to God that's uh, available to all of us if we come, um, if we ask, if, if we engage relationally with this living God. Uh, in verse 26, there's, and, and he spelled that out more in verse 21 to 24 there. Verse 26, there's truth about who Jesus is. And verse, uh, my point is, uh, truth in our lives can come in hundreds of different ways. We all need his perspective of truth, of what's really going on. Uh, and, and, and so, but it's truth that comes with grace. And there's such power when those two things are together. All truth with no grace, that's a tough place to live. And that's not going to set us free. All so-called, you know, grace without the truth and the clarity isn't going to give us what we need uh, to, to be set free in this embrace either. He, he comes with both. And in verse 17 and 18, uh, we see something really significant. It's that Jesus brings truth about her actual places of shame and disgrace, where he comes and he says, well, actually, yeah, what you said is right. Uh, you're, you've had this, you've had five husbands and you're not living with, and you're living with a man who's not currently your husband. And uh, it, was, it was significant that that would be out in the open and that in her place of shame, because she needed to feel, I believe, and I believe this is true for all of us, she needed to feel his love and his acceptance in the place that she thought that she would be unloved and not accepted. And that's what we all need. We actually need the experience with God and then with humans who are representing the grace and the mercy and the truth of God, his embrace. We actually need to be known for what, for those places of shame. Uh, the antidote to shame is to be known in our place of vulnerability and to have it be received with grace. And 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 truth and the truth part again is just because that's what's that's who that's what we're really experiencing that's what's going on uh it's like bringing it out into the open just pops the balloon of shame in our lives and um i can't even remember what it was about but two or three months ago there was something that was going on uh i was ex i could just tell i was experiencing some shame about something in in a uh interaction that i had um, with Jesse, and I was just noticing that I was off over the course of the day, and uh, and I realized. And, and what was interesting was I was going over in my head trying to figure it out. Why do I feel this way? What's going on? And um, what what broke the power of of what threw me off was when I I just I I brought Jesse into what I was experiencing. And I just said, hey, I, we had this interaction and I've just been kind of feeling like shame associated with it. And I'm not even sure why. And, uh, and then I started to talk it through and we kind of looked at, and we started to make some sense of it. And on the other side, it was gone. And uh, I'm not saying that always happens, but it's those, it's that embrace. I had an embrace with her where she was bringing grace and there was truth as we were trying to see what was going on and what was happening. It was really significant and powerful. 
in John 1, verses 14 and 17, it says this, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, referring to Jesus. Uh, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father. And it says this, full of grace and truth. And then he repeats it as if to say, hey, this is really important. And this is part of what the whole point of this whole gospel scroll is about. John 1, 17, it says, the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So when we have an encounter with Jesus, he gives us an encounter with grace and with truth. So how does he respond to our shame? With an embrace of grace and an embrace of truth. Uh, Sophia Ma is going to uh, jump on at this point and share a story uh, with us as we um, get close to, to wrapping things up here. Um, well, we're not, I'm going to get close to wrapping things up when she's done. Uh, but I'm going to pass this to Sophia because she's got some powerful things to share uh, about this dynamic in her life as she has walked uh, as God has met her in some places of shame in her own life um, and the freedom that it comes, so that it that has come. Many of you have the privilege of knowing Sophia. For those of you who don't, she's been loving Jesus and following him for 26 years of her life through highs and lows and uh, is just a, a compassionate woman who knows Jesus well. And so wanted to invite her and have her share a little bit of um, her own journey in meeting Jesus and others who represented Jesus in this way. John, thank you so much for um, just setting the, the scene and the stage for just the definition of, of shame and how Jesus, God, um, wants to respond to us in those places with grace and truth. I, yeah, I second um, watching The Chosen episode. It really undid me when I watched it. Um, so what I want to share with you all is um, how Jesus has allowed me to experience his desire and ability uh, to love us and redeem our places of shame in the context of community. Um, I have had many moments of meeting Jesus at the well in places of shame. And to be honest, I feel like it's almost an everyday experience. Um, where he allows me to turn to him uh, maybe quicker each day or trust him quicker with the things that the enemy throws at me. So um, what I wanted to share is just one experience um, that has been pretty impactful and, and life-changing in my life about uh, meeting Jesus at the well. Um, and it also will shed some light as to why I'm so excited about this new role, about connecting people and deep relationships of trust and love in our body. Um, so about 15 years ago, um, I was in a, I would say, confusingly um, inappropriate relationship. Um, later, others have helped me to define it as abuse. Um, at the time, I, he, Jesus led me to break that relationship, and he allowed healing to happen and to be seen by him through a, a really significant healing, inner healing prayer session um, with no one who was associated with what happened. Um, I felt like that at the time it was enough. Uh, I kind of put this memory or experience in, a, in a, the department of my memories that I labeled, no need to share because it will only bring harm. And I quietly closed it, was ready to pretty much prepare to bury it uh, until I went to see him face to face. Uh, but God had other plans for this. Um, so about four years ago, as I was preparing to turn 40, I really um, just had a desire in my heart. I felt like 40 was such a significant, you know, number in the Bible, and I really wanted it to be a time of um, just seeking him deeper for greater freedom in my walk with him. I was sharing with a mentor, and just, she was also praying with me just to, um, for just a place of uh, greater freedom, freedom from shame, freedom from insecurity. Uh, I was ready, as John shared, to um, receive more of the living water that Jesus had for me. Um, 
And so in prayer, uh, literally it was the day before my 40th birthday, and I had the honor of hearing someone's testimony. Uh, she was a uh, pastor's daughter in my former, former church. And I had known, I heard her, and she had totally rebelled against God and totally went far, you know, in the world and, and just wanted to do her own thing. And, and somewhere along the way made a radical transformation and was so in love with Jesus and radically pursuing him. And uh, on that day, I had the honor and just like, I was so hungry to hear her testimony. So uh, I was taking her to the airport. And in that 15 minute window, she shared with me the story of her own pain and brokenness and um, herself having been violated and just deep places of, of shame and how the Lord met her in that place. How the Lord met her in a place of um, healing and um, um, freedom and, and as um, to a place of now her career was pretty much worked around walking alongside others, walking through those deep, similar places that she had experienced. And I remember I was just about pulling up to the airport and the Holy Spirit just struck me as I heard her testimony, the tears, I'm like just sitting there, tears streaming down my face. Uh, at that moment, I felt like the Holy Spirit said, I want to redeem. Like, I hadn't thought about this memory that I shared about earlier. You know, I just kind of hit it. But I felt like he was bringing it up and saying, I want to redeem that story in your life. And I just, it was it was just a very emotional moment. And I shared briefly with my friend how I had something that I also wanted to see him redeem for me. And with the, like the surest confidence in her eyes, she spoke right to me and said, God will lead you every step of the way. I, I just didn't even know what that would look like, but the confidence she had when she shared that, I, I rode on the coattails of her faith at that moment and um, started praying, started praying for God to give me wisdom. And I remember um, journaling that night and one thing Jesus said was, um, I want you to walk a trust journey with me on this one. I am indeed sovereign and will walk, work this out for good. Trust me, trust all things to me. And um, I just surrendered and, and asked him to lead the way. And so the next day um, was my 40th birthday um, and it happened to be my mom's connection day and um, just the women gathered around me and prayed for me and just prayed blessing. And one of the, um, words just prophetically spoken over my life that day was God is going to slay this uh, a Goliath in your life like I, no one knew anything about what I was praying and seeking and and I felt like that was his first like confirmation that he's in this it's not just emotions it's not he's like literally with me in this and then um, I just received it and held it and just kept on just praying about how or what and that night we had life group and because it was my birthday there was a, a gathering um and it's just precious uh, dear sisters around me um and also time of prayer and blessing and i just shared i wanted to break shame over my life and um i remember one word that was also just a word of knowledge that uh, someone spoke was another just like a an invitation. I felt like he was opening the door at that moment to say, come, and this is the place where you're going to start your journey of sharing. And um, man, I, I still remember that night so clearly in my head as I shared the story of what had happened uh, with just trembling, um, tears. Um, everyone just listened with such grace and, and present. just was so present to me. And as I finished, um, people uh, sisters just came around and gave me an embrace literally the arms of God um, one sister called it an embrace a prophetic hug uh, of the father and I just I still remember just the depth of love I felt at that moment um, people praying uh, weeping with me and speaking words pictures and it was just such an incredible moment of um, experiencing his love in such a tangible way um, in this group, it, it wasn't a group where I was seeking like the answer, like tell me what to do. I kind of did say, what should I do next? And everyone was like, let's, let's trust God together in this. Let's wait on him. And, um, so it just was a journey from that point to uh, seeking godly counsel, people who are more experienced uh, to lead and help 
share with Albert, share with close, you know, it just was like he laid the foundation and went through a year of, of therapy with a really wonderful Christian counselor as referred to and um, went through groups like Dunamis Group that the Grecos had led. Uh, many different communities the past four years has been another layer of healing and freedom and um, confidence in his ability to, to work good um, out of our hard situations. Um, uh, I had the capacity to have able to be in all these groups. I, I feel like it's uh, just powerful to share it with even one trusted person. Um, uh, just looking back, I can see how God used people around me. Um, my, my friend who initially shared her testimony, her story, the mom's group, life group, and all these different places and such dear friendships um, along the way to um, help me experience God's love and healing. Um, it was my relationship in, in community that was an essential part of experiencing God's love. The second part I wanted to share was the redemption aspect of um, our story. Um, when we go through something that brings shame and hiding, uh, that confronts it and brings it into the light, not only does God want to do a healing work within us, but he wants to do a healing work, a redeeming work um, in others and, and those around us, um, like a ripple effect. Just as my friend experienced it, I experienced it, and, and his desire is for that ripple effect to permeate around us. And uh, so by his orchestration, in his timing, and by his spirit's leading, I began to share one-on-one -on -one with people who were back in the um, context of where, where it happened. And that was probably the hardest. I didn't want to create anything that was going to, um, yeah. I did find out later that, uh, so I shared with one person and realized that it wasn't just me who had experienced this um, experience. And then she actually knew somebody else and somebody else. And it just started a ripple effect of freedom for others who also walked through this very difficult uh, circumstance. Um, it, it, we could never underestimate the power of our testimony God wants us to be seen, known, and loved in community. Um, just as, in, as John shared, as Jesus um, shared his need and vulnerability to others, he's inviting us to do the same for the sake of freedom and healing and redemption for others. Um, we each have a story. We each have something to bring to the table. Um, we each have a need and uh, a desire for prayer and support. One of the joys that God has given me is to be able to get to hear people's stories and then connect, connect people to each other who've experienced the same thing. Um, for instance, someone who's walking through a hard time, when I hear about it, I, I remember, wow, this is someone else who's already gone through that time. And as they link together, there's this encouragement that comes uh, flowing from the experience of the first person who had received it. And it's like this mutual redemption, um, and that continues. Um, it's, it's how God turns beauty from our ashes. Um, so God, over the ADS year, during the month of asking what's next, he had spoken, connect, we're connecting, and strengthening the body was very highlighted to me, and I was excited that there was an opportunity to serve on staff in this way to connect others within the body for the strengthening of, of the body. Um, so my passion and desire is that we would have deep intentional connections within our community that foster a place of God's healing and redemptive work in our lives so that we can walk confidently, confidently out in the calling he has for each and every one of our lives. Um, I'm so thankful to be here in this body where the DNA is has already been that way. That's why I feel like God allow the circumstances to be such that it was a safe place uh, to, to share and be connected. Um, our prayer is that everyone would be connected into community in a deep way that fosters a place of centering on God and his presence, anchoring ourselves to him and his word, his truth. Um, we're deep, vulnerable kingdom relationships are, are um, built 
uh, where we can be strengthened and discipled by Jesus to love one another and obey his call in our lives. I just want to uh, give thanks, so much thanks for those who have been part of the journey, who were there in that very room when I first shared. Um, and all those that I've had the privilege of walking alongside, it's been just the, the greatest joy of my heart here in this body. And I pray that each of you would come to experience the powerful, redeeming work of Jesus to turn all any place of shame into a place of experiencing his deep love, healing, freedom, and confidence to walk out in your identity as his beloved children, and then inviting others into experiencing this amazing God. Each of us has such an important part to play in the giving and receiving of his love. Um, I, I just feel like when we're, we're anchored together, we're, we're that much stronger and uh, that much more the glory of God emanates from us as a body. So I, I look forward to how he will continue to draw us closer in, in, uh, in his love, uh, to love him deeper and to love one another uh, deeper in community. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that and even just modeling for us, um, being vulnerable and uh, letting us into the way that Jesus has embraced you. It's so powerful. Um, it's amazing. One of the things that Sophia said at the beginning, she said, I've had my own moments of meeting Jesus at the well. I really like that. It's like, that's a great way for us to think about this. It's like, um, where, where have we met, had to meet Jesus at the well where he embraces us with grace and truth? And, and where, where currently do we need to meet Jesus? I like that you said it's, um, this is often a, a day by day thing. When we come to Jesus, he, he does purpose and desire that shame would not be a part of our lives. Um, but yet we live in this tension of we won't like he wants us to fully experience that, but we still experience it because we live on this broken earth. And so, um, so it's powerful. So I want to, I want to land, land, land this plane. And uh, I'm just going to summarize the rest of this interaction. So the woman is amazed. She goes back to her town or her, her little area, area where she lives and she starts sharing about Jesus and people then come out to see Jesus and Jesus stays with them for multiple days and they begin their own journeys uh, with Jesus in this unlikely place, this Samaritan uh, village. And uh, church history, it's a little hard to pin down specifically, but um, actually assigns her a name, that this woman's name was Fotina. And uh, it's a little hard. There's different variations of the story, but Fotina basically became one of the leading evangelists and apostles, uh, or at least she is called one like the apostles in uh, church history. And isn't it amazing that the woman who went out in her shame, disassociating herself from the community around her, becomes one of the pillar evangelists of the early church and one like the apostles that Jesus built the kingdom and the early church on. And uh, she actually, the history set tradition tells us that she ended up being martyred by Nero in Carthage. And uh, all five of her sisters and two of her sons were evangelists as well. Isn't it amazing the way Jesus, his interaction transforms those places of shame and releases us into uh, purpose in our lives. Um, I just want to read this one. I, I was going to share a little bit more, but I think we're past time. I've got this trusty journal here from when I was 21. Uh, I was writing this experience. Basically, Jesus ended up meeting me a couple days later through a time of prayer with somebody. Uh, and he spoke through this person. In, I didn't even I didn't tell them anything about I was thinking. They did not know about intermediate microeconomics. And this person just started praying things over me that were exactly the things I was thinking. 
So they prayed some significant things. I'm just bawling my eyes out. And uh, this, this guy said, uh, why don't you just go lay on the carpet and spend some time just connecting with Jesus? And I just sensed his love and his presence. And this is what I said to God. I said, uh, I, I was basically bringing these things to him, this sense of rejection, uh, some of these questions. And, um, and I said, will disobedience cause rejection? And, and Jesus said, no. Israel disobeyed, and I still have not fully, I haven't rejected them. I came for them. Uh, will sin? No. David sinned greatly. Uh, and I said, will not spending enough time with you? And I felt this in my spirit, this sense of silence, and then a laugh. And he said, every person from Moses to Paul to David, all throughout the Bible, except Jesus, uh, they never spent enough time with me. Um, and, and then I said, well, well, God, you approved of Jesus, but he was perfect. And, uh, and he said, look at all these people. Um, and, and in your sinnest of sins, I still approve of you because um, – because my approval has to do with who you are and who I've created you to be. What you do is not what matters with my approval. It's who you are, a son. So you have my approval already, and it won't be going anywhere. And that phrase has stuck with me for the last 15 years. You have my approval already, and it won't be going anywhere. And so my prayer is that we would be able to experience God's embrace uh, and with him and with one another, as Sophia talked about. Um, so I, I'm just going to close us in a quick prayer. Um, we've gone a little long, so we're, we're not going to have another song of worship. I'm just going to uh, give us 30 seconds to a minute here just to kind of pause and I'll, I'll pray. And I just want to encourage you to begin the process of just bringing a place before the Lord. And then this next week, I'd encourage you, maybe with a journal, get some time alone with God and start talking to him about a place that you feel some shame in and bring a person or two who you trust, who can represent the heart of Jesus to you. Bring them in to some of these places if you haven't already and, um, and see, see how God will, will meet you and bring a transformation that anchors you into his purposes. So why don't you pray with me? And that'll conclude our, our time this morning. Um, Lord, we just come before you. And uh, there's places in our lives where we can want to hide, where we can want to wear masks, where it can be hard for us to really uh, believe that we're worthy of love and that um, you approve of us as your sons and your daughters. And um, so we bring, Holy Spirit, help us to, to know those places and to experience your grace and your truth in the midst of those places. And uh, yeah, so we commit these places to you this week. And as we move towards you, Jesus, uh, we're asking, uh, we're, we're not so much asking, but we are trusting that what you said, even to this woman at the well, uh, is true. That whoever asks of you, you'll respond and uh, you will give to them um, all that they need, all that their hearts need of this embrace with you of grace and truth. And so, Lord, we look to you and uh, we thank you that we can trust our lives and our places of pain and shame to you. You're trustworthy. It's trustworthy in your hands. And so we ask all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, that's going to conclude our service, our time for this morning. Thank you for joining and uh, praying God's richest blessings and uh, deep intimacy on every one of us this week. Uh, love you guys.